Hey everybody, Trey here. Welcome back to another series on the channel. A few months ago we finished up our SKU T and Hodograph series, and this series is going to take a look at another critical part of severe weather forecasting, and that is weather map analysis. When we're making a forecast, we're going through a bunch of different weather maps from the surface, as you see here, all the way up into our upper air maps showing what's going on in the upper atmosphere. And these, if you don't know how to read these maps, you're not going to be able to make a successful forecast. So this series is going to help you learn how to properly read these maps. And we're also going to tell you how these maps are made by hand and show you how you can make them and analyze them on your own. We'll start off here. This first video is going to go over contour analysis basics, what rules you can uh, use when you are making a contour analysis uh, yourself. And then we'll go in through each level of the atmosphere from the surface all the way up into the upper atmosphere and take a look at the most important levels that we look at when we're making a forecast, how to analyze those weather maps and why those, those uh, levels in particular are important. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started here. So we're going to talk in this first video about contour analysis, otherwise known as isoplething. And an isopleth is basically a fancy word for a contour. It's basically, it's basically any line of equal value or constant value across it. And there, if we're looking at a particular weather map here, say for example our surface map, these dark lines, these dark solid lines here are called our isopleths. They are in fact isobars because they are lines of equal pressure. Every value along a given isobar here has the exact same pressure. And every different variable in meteorology has a, iso, a, a different isopleth name associated with it. And these are going to be the most common that you'll see when you're making a forecast. The first one is for pressure. Those are called isobars. Then you have geopotential height, which is what you're going to see on your upper air maps. For example, this 500 millibar map here, these dark contours are all lines of equal geopotential height. And we talked about geopotential height in a couple of our previous videos. That's just the height of a constant pressure surface above mean sea level. So again, if you're looking ahead at a constant pressure surface, say the 500 millibar surface here, it would kind of look like a big sheet of paper. And the distance of that sheet, that constant pressure surface above mean sea level, is your geopotential height. And that's what we use when we're looking at our upper air maps, which are all on constant pressure surfaces. Those geopotential height contours are called isoheights or isohypses. Either, either term is acceptable. We'll also see uh, isopleths for temperature. Those are called isotherms. Dew point, those are called isodrosotherms. And wind speed, those are called isotacks. There, you can also see some for potential temperature. Those are called isentropes. And you'll see um, a type of analysis called isentropic analysis. That's where we look at a constant a surface of a surfaces of constant potential temperature or, or isentropes in the atmosphere. And that can tell us you know, where there are areas of ascent, etc. We're not going to worry about that too much for now. Perhaps in the future we'll do a video on potential temperature analysis or isentropic analysis. But these are going to be the main sort of isopleths that you're going to know need to know when you are going through different weather maps. Isobars most are going to be used on your surface maps. And then for your upper air maps, which are, you know, by definition on constant pressure surfaces, your 500 millibar map, your 700 millibar map, et cetera, et cetera, those are all on constant pressure surfaces. So we use our ISO heights on those um, upper air maps. And then the other ones, you can draw isotherms, isodrosotherms, isotacks on any map you like. Most of the time you'll see isotacks on your upper air maps, isotherms and isodrosotherms can be done both on surface and upper air maps. So let's do an example of isoplething ourselves. And there are several rules that we need to follow when we are doing a contour analysis or an isopleth analysis. The first rule that you have to follow is that iso, isopleths can never cross or merge. So if you see isopleths making a shape in the shape of an X or a Y or a T, you know you've done something wrong. Isopleths can never cross or merge. Probably the most important rule you can keep in mind there. Another rule is that an, iso, an isopleth can never come to an end within the field of observation. Weather data is constant. Just because we have different observation 
points on a given map, really we have those observation points for every single point in space on that map. But we, of course, can't have, we don't have enough, uh, you know, meteorological sampling equipment to do so. So we have to assume that meteorological data is constant. So you can never have a, an isopleth stop in the field of observation like that. You always have to assume that the data is constant and you're always going to end it kind of at the just past the edge of the field of observation. And another critical rule here is we always want to label our isopleths here. So whatever line this is, let's say this was the 65 degree line, we would always label it at the end and maybe a couple points in the middle. That helps keep our analysis neat and tidy and tells us which lines are which. And another critical rule to remember when isoplething is that isopleths can never have higher values on both sides of the line. So if we had an example, for example here, let's say we had an observation point of, of 85 here and 88 here. Well, our 84 degree isotherm can, or isopleth can never go in the middle of those two. That is not accurate because we have higher values on both sides of the isopleth. Our isopleth analysis, every isopleth is going to have lower values on one side and higher values on the other. And then there are a couple of other sort of guidelines that you can keep in mind when making a contour analysis. Where, as far as where to start on a given analysis, that's kind of up to you. Isoplething is more of an art than a science. So I know some people who kind of start at the, at the minimum. For example, when we're doing a surface analysis, when we're looking at isobars, they'll start with the contour at the minimum pressure and kind of work outward from there. I also know people who start at the, the maximum, start at the highest isopleth and work inward. Personally, I kind of pick an, an iso, isopleth that's kind of in the middle, and I just kind of work um, you know, work from there. I'll go, you know, perhaps decrease in my isopleths for there, and then I'll finish the rest of the analysis when I'm done with that, kind of go with those higher isopleths. It's up to you. It's whatever you're comfortable with. There's no correct way to start an isopleth analysis. Another critical thing to keep in mind is if you're printing out a map and you're doing an isopleth analysis by hand, um, you always want to use pencil and have an eraser handy. Isopleth analysis is, is very nuanced and you're going to make mistakes. So you always want to be able to adjust analysis, the analysis. You're going to want to use pencil with a very good eraser. So with those guidelines and rules out of the way, let's do a, an example isopleth analysis here. So this is, let's say we have our meteorological data field here and this is some random meteorological quantity. We'll call it temperature. So we're going to, in this case, we're going to draw isotherms. Here. So this would be an isotherm analysis. So let's go ahead and start with our 60 degree isotherm, or our 60 isopleth here. So isoplething is all about interpolation. Again, the data is continuous in this field, even though we have a finite number of observations. So we have to kind of assume and interpolate the values between two different data points here. So the way we do that is we pretty much assume that it's a constant gradient between two data points. So this kind of 56 to 64 um, gradient here, we'll use these two points as, as an example. That's eight degrees difference here across these two data points. And we're going to assume that that is a constant rate of change as you go from the 56, ice, the 56 observation here to the 64 observation down here. And that makes it easier for us when we're doing an isopleth analysis because if we want to do our 60 degree um, isotherm, we would put that right in the middle of the 56 and the 64 observations because 60 is exactly in the middle of 56 and 64. So we're going to go, we're going to start our 60 degree isotherm here. We're going to go right in the middle. Again, we're going to start at just, just past the edge of the observation. This is going to be our 60 isotherm here. And then we continue on through our data field here. We go to our next set of data points here, 59 and 62. Well, 60 is just a little bit closer to 59 than it is to 62, so we're gonna go a little bit closer than halfway between, closer hugging kind of that 59 degree value there. Then we have our 59 and our 65 degree value here. Of course, 60 degrees is much closer to 59 than it is to 65, so we're gonna go up like that. Now we have our 60 degree observation here, so our 60 degree isotherm is gonna go right through that data point there. Now you might say, well, that's going to be the end of our analysis. We're going to end it off right in here. 
and be done with it. That's our 60 degree um, isotherm. Well, that's not the case here. Notice that the rest of our observations, we have to use our observations in totality here. So we have 58 and 57 here. So our 60 degree isotherm is gonna have to drop back down because we have a 65 here and a 63 here. So we're gonna have to go back down here, 57 and 65, 60 is just a little bit closer to the 57, so we're gonna go something like that. Then between 57 and 63, 60 is right in the middle, so we go something like that, and then we can end our observation there just past the field, just past the data field there. And then of course we're gonna to, going to label our isopleth there, our 60 isopleth there, and that's how you do an isopleth. You're just gonna basically interpolate the data between these data points. And again, it's more of an art than a science. It's not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. So, especially when you're first doing an isopleth analysis, definitely have a pencil and an eraser handy so that you can change your analysis. Of course, I'm doing this on a computer, which is a little bit easier. I can just erase if I make a mistake. Just do a Command Z when I'm uh, when I make a mistake. But it is it does take a lot of practice. So. Hopefully this video will help you kind of get started with that. Let's do another isopleth here. Let's do our 62 degree isopleth here. So we'll start again, our 62. We'll start just after the field uh, of data here. 62, now we use our 60 degree isopleth as a set of values here. So think of this as a continuous line of observations at 60 degrees here. So our 62 degree isopleth is going to be between our 60 degree isopleth and this 64 degree observation right in here. And of course, it's gonna be about halfway between there. We have a 62 degree value right there, so we go right through that. Then we go back up our 60 uh, isopleth and our 65 degree observation there. Go kind of close to the middle there. Our 60 line, 60 degree observation there, 65 here. So we go back in there as well. And then we'll notice here our 60 degree isopleth and our 65 and 63 con or observations there. So we're gonna go just, just above those and then we can end our, our isopleth there just past the field of the data. So that's how you do an isopleth analysis right there. It's, it's become simple with a lot of practice, but when you're first starting out, it does take a lot of practice to get used to it. But that is how you do an isopleth analysis. It's again, more of an art than a science and it takes a lot of interpolation to do so. But because we're, we're considering these as kind of a smooth gradient between these two, of course we know that weather is, is not perfect. We're gonna have very small changes in temperature in here that might not be fit that constant gradient kind of um, you know, rule there. But to make our lives easier, that's the way we do it. We kind of think of these, the, the um, space between these two points as kind of a constant change in whatever value you are isoplething. Now, we can have closed isopleths as well, and you'll see this a lot on your surface analysis maps. When you have a, a center of low pressure, a center of high pressure, you're going to have closed contours or closed isopleths here. So let's take a look at this example here. We have, uh, let's you know call this whatever variable you want, but let's do our 48 degree isopleth here. We'll notice that we have our minimum right in here, 46 right in here, and all the values outside of that 46 area are much are higher are in the 50s, are higher than our 48 degree isopleth that we're drawing. So our 48 degree isopleth, if we started somewhere in here, 46, between the 46 and 54, our 48 would be closer to the 46. We would drop down here, 48 much closer to 46 than 55. 50 right in between there. Then we go up. You'd have our closed a closed isopleth there for our 48 isopleth. And then you would continue, let's say we wanted to do our 50 degree isopleth there, much of the same, right? 48, and all our values here are at or above 50, so our 50 degree isopleth would look something like this. We would just kind of go in the middle, of course, taking our 50 degree observation there, and then going back up here. So we'd, we'd have our 50 isopleth right there. So you can have closed contours, but again, always remember that contours can never cross or merge and make kind of these X, Y, or T shapes. If you if you see that on your isopleth analysis, you know you've done something wrong. So that is gonna finish up this video. Hopefully that was a, a, a simple enough introduction for you in isopleth analysis. Again, we're gonna go in depth into each of the different important levels, starting with our surface map 
in our next video. We'll go through the all the different symbols that you need to know. And then we'll go and actually do a hand analysis of a surface map. Usually that's going to be the most common hand analysis that you're going to see is a surface map done by hand. And you're by the time we get through the surface, you'll know how to actually make these kind of surface maps by hand and identify different features on those surface maps, such as lows, highs, frontal zones, etc. And then we'll move on into our upper air maps uh, after that. So with that, thanks for watching. We will see you in the next video.